and we put it. So, so uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our uh, session of the lecture seminar on quantum mechanics. So, today's speaker is Professor Manuel Friedrich from the University of Erlangen. And Manuel briefly uh, evolves around uh, mathematical analysis in mechanics, not only continuum mechanics, but also, say, discrete. Um, discrete mechanics, and today we will speak about finite crystallization via statistical condition. Thank you very much, Martin. It is always a pleasure to be here. Um, I checked today in the morning, that's actually the, the sixth time that I'm presenting in this very um, seminar, so I'm very happy to be back. And uh, as you already said, so I will speak about a um, problem in crystallization. It will be a joint work on a joint work with a former postdoc of mine, Leonard Kreutz, who is now in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, so the problem is about um, crystallization. So that's the phenomenon that periodic uh, or uh, particle systems, they um, tend to arrange in periodic structures. And you can tackle that um, with mathematical methods. And the way I do it is um, via molecular mechanics. And here the idea is that you um, model the atoms in space by an optimistic configuration, so point in space, which interact with each other via um, classical interaction potentials. And you can take whatever you want. The simplest case for me would be pair interactions which are governed by a Leonard Jones potential. So that's as a minimum somewhere for small distances, it's repelling, and for um, long distances, it's attracting. Of course, you can also take something more elaborated. You can take free body interactions, multi body interactions, but whatever you do, the problem is always the same. The crystallization problem is um, trying to minimize this energy and asking whether ground states, so global minimizers of this energy, are periodic structures or not. That's the main problem. And if you think about the Leonard Jones potential in 2D, uh, this is the conjecture. The optimal thing to do should be the triangular lattice. And something in that direction was proved by a Florian trial for the variant for a variant of the Leonard Jones potential in the so-called thermodynamic limit which means that the number of atoms n tends to infinity. Today, I'm interested in a slightly different problem, namely in the problem of so-called finite crystallization, where the number n of particles is always fixed. And in this setting, basically, nothing is known. So nothing is known on crystallization for the Leonard Jones potential. And this is somewhat a more difficult problem, because if you have a finite number of atoms, as you see here, your configuration will have a boundary. And this boundary will have a huge effect to the, to the problem and that we're gonna see in the problem. So in, in finite crystallization, the first thing is um, a caveat. So you should ask yourself, can you actually expect crystallization? And we already know that in 1D, you cannot expect it because if you have a finite chain and you have Leonard Jones interactions, not all the bonds between neighboring atoms will be exactly the same, but you will have surface effects coming at the left and the right boundary. You can only expect something like crystallization with an exact same distance between all neighboring atoms if you talk about um, so-called short-range potentials where you have an interaction only up to a certain point, maybe in such a way that only nearest neighbor interactions interact, and then you can actually prove that the best thing to do is a chain where all the atoms have the same distance. Concerning 2D, um, the restrictions are even more severe, so we can have a proof that's going back to high and radian only in a very special case, namely for the so-called sticky disk potential. The sticky disk potential, what is it? You can see it on the right, and if you want, you can understand that as a brittle limit of the Leonard Jones potential if you send the exponent p to infinity, which kind of means that you take this well here and it make it more and more narrow, and in the limit, it collapses to the sticky disk potential, which is infinite for distances smaller than one. There is a preferred distance, which in my model is just normalized to one. And at this distance, you have an interaction, which is normalized to minus one. So you gain minus one if the distance is exactly one. And once the distance is bigger than one, there is no interaction at all. So this hugely simplifies crystallization because now the problem is a, ge a purely geometric problem. Namely, you want to, to understand what is the maximal number of tangencies between spheres. So here I have spheres, and I just want to maximize the number of touching points. And often these spheres are also called hard spheres because they are not allowed to overlap. And this overlapping is 
um, prohibited by the infinite stickiness potential for distances smaller than one. Okay, so in this uh, setting, you can prove um, crystallization, um, which goes back to Heidmann and Radin. Uh, I just want to emphasize one thing, namely that there is no elasticity in the, in the, in the model. Namely, once the atoms are not exactly a distance one, there is no interaction at all, so the, the bond is immediately broken. Um, there is a slight generalization to this model. You can do something here at the sticky potential. You can replace it by a so-called soft potential, where you have a linear growth here. So you don't have to jump immediately, but you have a linear growth. But still, this is no elasticity. Elasticity would require that you have actually a quadratic growth. That would be the, the, the right response to an uh, elastic spring, if you want. So this is everything we have for the moment, and we um, cannot, we, we have no, um, nothing beyond this setting. So I want to um, talk about something else, namely the question, can you have other lattices in, in 2D? I mean, I talked about the freedom and about the tri triangular lattice, but can you also have um, other lattices? Yes, you can, if you take an appropriate energy. And what uh, Ulysses Stefanelli and Eduardo Manini did so they added uh, another term to the energy. Apart from the two-body potential, they also have a three-body potential, which plays with angles in the following way. So whenever you have two bonds, they form an angle. And this angle will contribute to the energy in terms of a tertiary potential that you see here, which favors certain angles. And I favor the angle or multiples of the angle 2 pi over 3. And 2 pi over 3 is the angle that you have in a regular hexagon. So if you prefer these angles, then you can expect somewhat that you have a less close of packing, which is um, the, the hexagonal lattice. And that's exactly what they were able to do. Namely, they get um, crystallization in the hexagonal lattice under this assumption. So here, um, they can work with a potential which is actually quadratic around the minimum. So it seems that there is elasticity inside the model, but it's not really inside because here you cannot really see in the picture, but here I cannot use a potential which has a quadratic row, but it has a kink. So it's, it has a, um, it's not a differentiable at the minimum. And I will explain you later in my talk why you need an assumption. So it's uh, um, exactly what I said here for the V2, you, don't, you can take it smooth, but then you have to pay the price here. And the kink is infinite or? Is it's finite. Yeah. I will tell you exactly what I need in the talk. Um, you can play around with the potentials a little bit. You could also take a tertiary potential which um, favors multiples of pi over two. And then you can expect that the square lattice is optimal. OK, um, so whatever model you take, the proof works always the same. It's a proof by induction via methods in graph theory. So you, you have your points and your bonds, and you consider that as a, as a planar graph by um, um, understanding the vertices, uh, the, the atoms as the vertices and the bonds as the edges. And then there's an induction argument behind. Namely, you take your configuration, you look to the interior, and you look to the boundary. For the boundary, you do some kind of fancy estimates that I will tell you later. And for the interior, you use an induction hypothesis namely that it's a smaller configuration. And on the smaller configuration, you already know something, maybe by induction, that ground states are already a subset of a lattice. And then you glue these two things together. And this is a rather complicated method. So um, um, Leonard and I were thinking, okay, let's try to have a different um, proof strategy. And um, this proof strategy uses what we call uh, stratification. And that's the content of my talk to, to present a new approach to proving um, crystallization results of this, this type. So that's the, the outline of my talk. Um, so my talk will be exclusively about the square lattice. That's where we have this method right now. And the first thing that I would like to do, I want to tell you something more about the square lattice, some more info about the model. In particular, I would like to discuss what's the minimal energy that you can expect. Then, I mean, um, to understand the novelty, what we have, I should um, take some time to review the proof, which is there by Stefanelli and collaborators. And at the end of my talk, I will come to our novel um, perspective to the problem. Okay, and um, that's again the slide on the model that I will um, take throughout the talk. Um, an important thing is just notation. For me, configurations will be always indicated by a capital X. So that's a configuration consisting of n points. And as I said before, it's important that we have short range potentials. 
and I will take a potential which is already zero at square root of two. This um, makes sure that in my square lattice, I only have interactions along the vertical and the horizontal lines, but I never have interactions along the diagonal. That's important. So whenever I have bonds, they will be vertical or horizontal in them in the square lattice. Okay, let's start with the square lattice. Let's talk about the energy and let's keep things simple for the moment. So later I want to prove crystallization. So I want to prove that minimizers are on the lattice. But let's first of all, assume that we're already on the lattice and let's um, calculate what is the minimal energy that we can expect. And the minimal energy that we can expect is the number of bonds times minus one. So why that? Well, each bond it has length one in my, in my um, model, so it will give me a minus one. So each horizontal and vertical line will give me minus one. And there will be no interactions of the, of the angles because in the lattice, all the, um, all the angles are multiples of pi over two. So I'm always in the minimum of the tertiary potential. So the energy is just the number of interaction times minus one. Okay, the number of bonds times minus one. And you can calculate that. It has two pieces. It has an, um, a bulk term and a surface correction. And this bulk term is just an energy pi times per, per particle times the number of particles. And it's given by minus two. And uh, let's first of all um, try to understand why I see this minus two here. Well, for each atom which is in the interior, I have four bonds. So that should give me a minus four, but be careful, each bond is associated to two atoms, so I have to divide that by two. This gives me a minus two per particle. That's the average that I can expect. But then I have a surface correction because there are a certain number of atoms at the boundary which are less happy because they have less than four neighbors. And this will give me the surface correction, which is of, of this form. Um, so um, therefore, it's interesting actually to, to work with a different energy, a so-called renormalized surface energy, where I subtract the bulk term. So I subtract minus 2n, so I plus 2n. And I also take that times two, because now this energy is doing nothing else than counting the number of missing surface atoms, surface bonds, sorry, number of bonds which are missing at the surface. So minimizing this energy, the original one, is the same as minimizing this renormalized surface energy. And minimizing the renormalized surface energy tells you that it's kind of an isoparametric problem. So what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to minimize a surface energy under a given volume, and the volume for me is just the number of atoms n. Okay, so it's um, it's an isoparametric problem, and that's actually how I want to compute the minimal energy, which um, should be now this one for the renormalized surface energy. The upper bound will be done by a construction, and the lower bound will be related to an isoparametric problem. So let's try to understand why the number of missing surface bonds is exactly this one. So for the upper bound, I just give you the explicit construction and I start the construction somewhere. Let me take a, a square five by five. And this has the renormalized surface energy 20 because I have five missing surface bonds on the top, five on the bottom, five left and five right. And now I'm starting to add atoms. For instance, I add atom one, one atom here and this will give me two additional surface bonds which are missing, one on top and one on the bottom. And now I can go on with the construction. I add atoms and you see by this, I do not really change the number of missing surface bonds. Only at this point, when I add a new row, I have two additional ones, one on left and one on right. So here the renormalized um, surface energy jumps from, 24, from 22 to 24. And now you can go on, you can fill the square without um, changing the surface. Now, you need kind of to believe me that this number that you have here is exactly corresponding to um, this number here involving the seal function. I don't really give you the exact calculation. I just try to convince you that these points where you actually have a change between the surface energy is exactly the point where the, the seal function jumps. Okay, so this is about the um, upper bound. The lower bound is a little bit more interesting. And I do it um, by means of an edge parametric, uh, parametric inequality. And the idea is the following. So you take your configuration, which is now an arbitrary configuration in set two, and you take the longest horizontal chain of atoms 
and the longest vertical chain of atoms, which are indicated in red and blue. Actually, what I take is the projections of the numbers onto, onto the coordinate axis, but that's not, a, that's not important. Just think of the longest line horizontally and vertically. And then I know two things. So first of all, I know this lower bounds. So the renormalized surface energy should be at least 2p1 plus 2p2. The reason for that is that whenever I start from a red atom and I go up, at some point, point I see a missing surface bond. And if I go down, I also see a missing surface bond. So for each red atom, I have two missing surface bonds. That's the same for all red atoms and also the same for all blue atoms. Uh, atoms, so I get this lower bound. And the second observation that I need is that if I take um, the product of the two guys, that should be at least n, because all the atoms should be contained in a rectangle of length p1 and height p2, so the product needs to be bigger than n. And now I just replace p2 um, by this um, inequality here, and I have um, a problem which just depends on p1, and I can solve this simple minimization problem by optimizing P1. I sneak in the seal function by um, um, subtracting two. And then in the very last step, you can um, argue that since all the involved quantities are even numbers and you have a strict inequality here, um, if this is true already, this has to be true. So I'm a little bit too fast here, but it's not the point um, how to, to close this argument. Um, my argument is that actually what I do here is very simple. So I start with a configuration. I take the longest horizontal and vertical line. I do the projection, and then I solve a very simple minimization problem. And if you want, this is a, a discrete version of an isochromatic inequality. OK, um, so now to the general strategy. So everything I did now was on the lattice, but I want to prove crystallization. So I don't want to assume a priori that I'm on the lattice. And now uh, the general strategy is as follows. And you now take any configuration, and you now want to show that for any configuration, you have this lower bound for the energy, and given for the original one or for the renormalized surface energy, that's not, that's not important. And in the second step, you also want to prove that the equality only holds if all the bond lengths are one and all the angles are multiples of pi over two. This tells you that in the equality case, you already need to be a subset of the lattice because. Um, uh, connected um, subsets, sorry, connected sets um, of points where all the angles are one and the um, all the bonds are one and the angles are multiples of pi over two needs to be a subset. So you see the general argument is also very much about the energy. The only thing that you need to prove, you need to prove this lower bound for the energy and also the strict case. I will not speak about this. I will rather speak about the lower bound of the energy. Once you have that, then basically you can conclude the argument. And that's already what I said, and you get the C2 property. OK, now I first of all want to show you how this argument of give, getting the lower bound for the energy works in the, um, in the proof by Manini Pirvano Stefanelli, who did the original proof. And um, to explain this argument, let me first of all again do the case that I'm on the lattice first, because this is a little bit easier to explain. And then I will um, go to the general. And it's interesting because their way of, of counting the energy is very different to what I did before, how I was, how I was deriving the lower bound. And let me try to give you the argument by Stefanelli and co-workers. So um, they take a general configuration and they want to work with bond graph layers. So they don't like pieces like this. So they don't like an additional atom. So what they do, they first of all want to get rid of this. So I just take it away. I get a new configuration, which I call X prime. And I will from now on work with X prime. I just have to keep in mind that I change the energy by removing one atom, or more, more precisely, I remove one bond. And I have to take care of this when going to this new configuration. OK. And now their actual counting starts, because what they do, they do they remove a bond graph layer, so which is, are the gray atoms here. And they get a new configuration, which is even smaller. I call it X prime prime. And they have to take care of the difference of the energy, which is exactly the number of bonds that they delete by this um, operation. So what is D? D is the number of atoms at the boundary that they delete. And I claim that the change of energy is D plus D minus four. So why so? 
At the boundary, you have D atoms. So you also have D bonds at the boundary that you remove. But moreover, you also have bonds to the inside. You also remove them. And now you see that for almost all atoms, you have a bond to the inside. For all atoms but four, namely the four at the corners. So the second um, sum here is the number of boundary atoms minus four because you have to take care of the corners. And that's exactly the change of, of energy if you remove a boundary. And there's another thing that I have to observe. Namely, the new configuration has again a boundary, but the number of points at the boundary is now a little bit smaller. And you can calculate that you lost eight atoms. Now the boundary has B minus eight atoms. OK, that's one step of the operation. And what they do now, they do um, um, an induction of this. So they um, over and over again remove the boundary and see what they get. And this is kind of um, what you get then. Just a little bit of notation. So Xi for me is the um, is the configuration that you get after removing i times the boundary. And so in each step, I remove this number of atoms, di. This is the number of atoms at the boundary. And then in the next step, you have less atoms at the boundary. The this difference is exactly eight, as I discussed on the previous slide. OK, and the overall number of atoms is just summing up all the um, atoms that you removed in all of the steps. And you can calculate that, which is something which just depends on the number of iterations you do. E is the number of iterations. And the last ingredient, so this gives you a lower bound on the number of iterations. The final ingredient is the energy. And the energy, you get it by summing up all the difference of energies from all steps. And in each step, it was um, d plus d minus 4, so this one. And if you sum up the first term, this will give you two times the number of, uh, of atoms. This is the bulk term. And this minus 4, which was coming from the corners, is very important this because this will give you exactly the, say, the correct surface correction if you also take into account the number of i iterations. OK, um, so I was a little bit fast here. I skipped some of the details. Um, I just want to convince you this is something you can do. But for me, it's a little bit more complicated than the argument that I was doing at the beginning. At the beginning, I just took one horizontal and a vertical line and a projection argument. And here, I have to count uh, quite a bit to get there. Um, in particular, there are two ingredients which are very important that you are not allowed to miss. Namely, that when you count the number of bonds that you delete, you have to be sure that most of the bonds um, have um, three bonds that you lose, but some of them only have two, namely the, the four at the corners. So you have to understand that correctly. And the second um, very important ingredient is that you need a relation between the number of atoms n and the number of boundary atoms. So you kind of need to relate the number n and the number of iterations. That's the second important ingredient in this calculation. OK. Everything's still on the lattice now, uh, but I want to prove crystallization. So the next thing that I should tell you how um, Stefanelli and co-workers deal with the general case. So a lower bound for the energy when I don't assume um, that I'm already on the lattice. And this is now kind of the, the, the count possible counterexample why crystallization could not be true, which is what we call the stadium. And and um, why is this um, example constructed like this? So if you look to the boundary, you see that I'm missing the four corner atoms. And that's very dangerous for my uh, calculation because I want to see of 2D minus four here, and I'm missing four bonds. Actually, I have four bonds too much to the interior. So that would, could be um, much better than I expect in a crystallization side. So that's kind of the enemy of crystallization. So if you see this example, you would say, OK, this is not really a counterexample because here you have a lot of defects. You have a lot of atoms which have less than four bonds. So all these atoms, they will contribute to the renormalized surface energy. So this is not a counterexample, of course. But at the same time, you see that my proof needs to take care of the fact that for this boundary layer, I'm not seeing the exact number of bonds that I delete when I delete the boundary. So I'm not seeing 2d minus 4, which I would expect. So um, the guys need to um, take care of this suitably. And uh, that's, that's what they do. So that's the argument. So um, what you can prove, I mean, you're not, you're not anymore a subset of the lattice. But for other reasons that I don't detail, you can still prove 
that all the bonds, they are um, kind of um, with an angle which is almost pi. So you get chains which are almost straight and um, atoms which are um, almost orthogonal. So you know that along a chain, all the angles are almost pi. And now they go around um, this outer layer and they pick up all the interior angles of this polygon. Um, better to say I pick up um, the interior angles minus pi. And if you sum that up, this gives you a minus two pi. This is a, a version of gauss bonnet theorem, or I mean, simpler said, it's just the interior sum of a polygon. So if you sum up the interior angles, that gives you a number. And if you look to the deviation of pi, then this will give you a minus two pi. Okay. Um, just think of a square. I mean, then you have four times a minus pi, uh, four times a minus pi half. Okay, and now you, you lose that in the following way because you have the contribution coming from um, from the angular potential. So the angular potential near um, the minimum, say pi here, is linear. So the deviation can be um, estimated like this with a linear power, and I know that this sum here is at least two pi. So I get a constant, and if I tune this constant, I can make this constant bigger than four. And you see here, I was missing a plus four in the energy estimate, but I kind of can compensate that, that I'm sure that in the angular contribution that is at least a four, such that if I combine that again, and I'm not just looking to the bonds, but to the entire energy, which also involves the, the, the angles, then I can compensate for the missing minus four, I get it here. And you kind of need to tune this constant. And this constant, if you want, is nothing else than the, the slope here. And this is now um, the answering your question. So you kind of need to tune that in order um, that two pi times this one gives you the right number. So you have to calculate that, but you can do it. But it's quantified. So it's not OK that you have any kind of linear slope, but you need a certain slope in order. To but the important argument is that the angular potential is able to compensate for the fact um, that you have maybe not the right number of bonds in this, in this um, bond missing calculation. So this argument also tells you why elasticity is out of business. So elasticity would mean that here in my estimate, I have a, um, a square that would be the elastic case. And you see my whole argument breaks down if I have a square here then I cannot estimate this with the linear, linear sum. So it doesn't work anymore. Okay, so you see the proof strategy for um, like this doesn't uh, account for elasticity. Okay, so that was the first um, part of the argument. And now the second part of the argument I, is I need to kind of do this an induction argument. Okay, and the induction argument was um, about removing the boundary and um, I'm removing the boundary now once. I'm calling the new configuration X prime and the D is the number of boundary atoms. So this is what I get from the previous slides, the correct um, energy at the boundary. So I see that I subtract two D minus four. Then for the blue piece, this is now a smaller configuration. For this one, I can use the induction hypothesis. It's a smaller configuration. I know already that an energy lower bound is this one. Be careful now. It has a smaller number of atoms. It does not have n atoms, but n minus d. That's why I get my formula with the, the right number of atoms, n minus d. Okay, and you can simplify that. So that's halfway, but I'm still not really satisfied because I still have this number d, which I don't know. And therefore, I need the second ingredient. I was telling you that before, it's important to have a relation between the number of atoms n and the number of boundary atoms d. And I kind of need an argument for that now. And now comes another um, crucial ingredient, which is a, a topological invariant for planar graphs, namely um, Euler's formula. We need it here. And the idea is, is, is more or less the following. I tried to, to explain it to you in a simplified case, namely, assume for the moment that the energy is minus the number of bonds. This is true for um, configurations in the lattice because the number of bonds is exactly giving you the energy up to a sign. In general, it's not right, really true, but it's true more or less, so you can assume it for my argument. So the energy is minus the number of bonds. And the second ingredient that I also need is that I can um, relate the number of faces in the bond graph to the number of bonds. So all my faces are squares, so they have uh, four edges. So if I sum up all the faces, 
I should count each of the of the edges. Actually, I count each of the edges twice because each edge is contained in two faces. Almost all of the edges are contained in two faces, but not the ones at the boundary. So I have to so subtract once the, the edges at the boundary. Okay, now you have a relation between F and the bonds and D. And now you use Euler's formula, which is this one, the number of atoms minus the number of bonds plus the number of bases is one. And now um, you can get this uh, relation out of this one and you um, plug in this relation into, into here. And then you get exactly this one where I again use the energy instead of the bonds. And then by some magic, you can actually prove that this holds true if and only if this holds true, which is exactly the right lower bound that I want. So I know that I was uh, way too fast on this slide because the DD details are not important. The only thing that I want to, to tell you is that you need another important ingredient in order to um, relate D to the problem. And the way you do that, you use Euler's formula, which allows you to, to calculate the number of bonds with the number of atoms and the number of bases. And then for me, like um, that's just a miracle that the right energy comes up. Okay. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the um, Stefanelli approach. So um, there are two crucial ingredients in the proof, this boundary energy estimate, where you need the number of bonds, right, that you delete, or you can compensate um, with the angles. And the second one was using Euler's formula in order to get the number of boundary um, atoms right. And uh, our idea was that we wanted to have an approach which, which doesn't use either of that because um, it's not very flexible. So at the end, we want to maybe go to three dimensions and there you cannot use the boundary energy estimates. So we want to have first steps in order to have strategies which don't use Euler's formula and which don't use the, the energy estimate. And um, now let me come back to my original um, um, calculation on the lower bounds. So I give you again our lower bounds, which was the following argument. So you take in the square lattice, the longest horizontal chain, the longest vertical chain, and you get the lower bounds because you know that the renormalized surface energy is at least two times the length of this guy and two times the length of this guy. And then you have this simple minimization problem. Now let's assume, or let's try to do the same argument if I'm not on the lattice. And um, maybe the first thing that I could consider is um, the, again, the stadium, because it's my first enemy of crystallization. And then unfortunately, I realized that my argument does not work anymore. So if, if I look to this red atom and I start to go up into this chain, which I will call uh, also a stratum in the following, following a stratum of, of atoms, then I'm not encountering at some point the missing surface bond. But unfortunately, I'm running into the blue lock chain of atoms. So it's not true anymore that I start here and at some point I miss a missing surface bond, um, but I kind of go to the other chain. So my whole argument breaks down. But now let's dream for a moment. Dreams are important in life. Um, namely, I remove some of the uh, bonds in the bond graph. You cannot really see it. So I highlight it like this. So I remove these bonds. I don't tell you at the moment why I'm allowed to do that, but I just do it. And once I do it, everything is okay and again, because if I start now here, I can go up. At this point, I uh, counter missing surface bond and also if I go down. So then the argument works again. So now everything is about telling you why I, am I allowed to remove these um, bonds. And this is what we call stratification. Um, and that's how the, that's the main lemma now. And the lemma goes as follows. So we take a, a bond graph, which is associated to the atoms and to the bonds. And we say that we find another um, set of edges, which is a subset, such we have a good energy bound. And we have some additional property on, on this new bond graph. So the important thing is that the edges is a subset of the old one, which just means that I'm deleting a certain number of, of bonds, as you see it here in the right picture. So um, in order to explain what the lemma actually does, let me give you the proof. So I'm giving the proof before the statement. Um, so the point is, I want to produce strata, which, is, which are almost straight. So which do not really change their orientation. So here we have one which changes its orientation by pi hat. 
So I don't want that. So whenever I encounter a chain of atoms which changes orientation, at some point I know that um, the change of orientation gives me a deviation of at least pi over six. And then I do the Ulisse Stefanelli argument. So if I have a deviation of my angle from pi, I can, um, I can control that with my tertiary potential. And um, this will be um, bounded from below by a constant, which I can tune such that this gives me at least a one. This tells me that I can remove one of the bonds. I pay energy for that, but as, at the same time, I compensate by that by um, taking care of the angular potential. So it's exactly the same argument as in the Stefanelli um, in the Stefanelli argument. So this gives me an energy bound. Does it change the angular constraints? Uh, like in your paper, do we have different the minimal angles for those angular yeah. potentials? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but um, the important thing is, or an interesting thing, we only need one condition at pi. At pi half, we don't even need a condition anymore, but they need. But uh, we didn't actually calculate the values because it's not so important then. So the important thing is that you get them bound on the energy. And here I can, comp I can control the energy of this new configuration, so the energy contained in the bonds by the original energy, which also has the angles inside, because I need to compensate the, the deletion of, of bonds or by the, the fact that I delete bonds by um, the contributions coming from the angular potential. Okay, so I'm kind of allowed to remove some of the bonds and then I'm in business again because I can use my original argument. Before I um, complete the proof, let me tell you one thing, which is uh, also kind of interesting. Namely, um, now the renormalized surface energy, which is given here, um, can be very simply calculated in the number of strata. So the number of strata is for me here S. And what is a stratum for me? It's just a chain of atoms which begins somewhere and ends somewhere. And each su such stratum contributes two to the energy because I have a missing surface bond at the beginning and at the end. So the renormalized surface energy is nothing else than two times the strata, which are contained in my bond graph. And um, on the other hand, the number of the length of the strata. So if I take the length of each of these chains, I, uh, I um, count how many atoms are in this chain. I sum over all these chains. This gives me two N. And the reason for that is that each atom is contained in exactly two. So this will give me a two N. Okay, this you need to keep in mind now when I want to do the, the final proof. So the final proof works as follows. I take any configuration. Now it's not in the lattice. It's a general configuration. So there could be dislocations and so on. And it suffices to prove a lower bound on the number of strata because then I get exactly the lower bound that I need on the renormalized surface energy. That's the argument that I said to you before that basically um, the number of strata is related to the renormalized surface energy here. So if you find a lower bound for that, you also have the lower bound for that. So you just need to count the number of chains in the bond graph, and that's exactly the argument that I that I did before. I um, choose the longest horizontal and the longest vertical, and I tell you in a minute why I can assume this one that the product is big enough. But once I have this. I can exactly do the argument again, because my argument didn't use at all that I'm on the lattice. I'm just using the fact that I have our two chains and that um, starting from each of these chains, when I go along the, along the strata, I encounter missing surface bonds. That's the only thing that I use. So the argument of set two still works. So what is left, I should tell you, why can you get this one, that the product of the lengths is at least n? Well, um, you can assume that the number of strata is not too big. If it was big already, then I'm already done because uh, I only want to prove a lower bound. Okay. If it's big, I'm done. If it's not big, if I don't have too many and I know what the sum over the length of the strata is, there needs to be at least one which is not, uh, not too short. So at least one of them is big enough. That's the, that's the basic argument. So if you don't have too many and you have a um, um, control on the length, you find one which is big. And then you also can argue um, by some more details that you also have the other one not too small and then the product is bigger than Okay. So the final thing that I wanted to, to show you is um, the following. It's about um, a fluctuation estimate. 
So, and you have seen in my pictures that my um, configurations, they look squarish. And this is true up to a certain fluctuation because what you can prove is that configurations can look a little bit like this. So they deviate from a square by putting some of the atoms to the right. Uh, and here you can have a certain number of additional lines which scale like n to the one four. So that's uh, kind of an n to the one four law for the lines. And in each of these lines, you have about square root of n many atoms. So this tells you that configurations, they can you can move around atoms up to this order, up to the order n to the three, four of atoms. And the idea which is behind that um, is roughly the following. So it's true that you have a configuration like this, a square plus an additional atom. I um, indicated like this. So then by our argument with the surface energy, I can remove one line here. So this makes the surface energy smaller by two. And now I have to add these atoms again, and I do it like this. Okay. So, and I have new two new surface um, bonds which are missing here. So this configuration has the very same energy as the original. Maybe I put it again. And now you can do that again. So I'm removing again one of these lines. And I'm producing a new line with that. And this has the same energy. And you can repeat that up to a certain point. And the number of iterations you can do without changing the energy is exactly of the order n to the one four. So that's kind of telling you that this needs to be um, this is an, um, you find configurations where you can move so many atoms, but all, our argument also shows that you cannot do more than that. So you all, we can also prove the atom out. And the statement goes as follows. It's very much related to the proof that I showed you before. And um, so SH and ASV are the longest chains in, in this picture here. And um, without restriction, I assume that the red one is bigger than the, the blue one. And then you um, do the following. You recall that this was the main argument that I did. So this was the lower bound. And I already know that I'm a minimizer, so I have this upper bound for the energy. Okay. So this was the main argument replacing the vertical line by using the product of SH and SV. And now you multiply by SH and you get this one. And then you have a quadratic formula you just solve it. And if you solve it, you exactly get that you're fluctuating of your length between square root of n, where you can add something and you can subtract something, and you see that this is of the order n to the one four. So it's really basically once you're at this point, um, understanding this picture is nothing else than solving a quadratic equation. That's of course very simple, but you have to come to this. Point. So that's what you do for SH, and in the same um, same way, you can also do it for SV. Okay. A final, oops. A final slide um, about an um, outlook. So now you can ask yourself: So why do I do all this business? Um, the proof was already there. Now I have a different method of proving the same thing. But um, one idea is that we can um, use this in the future to prove other things which are not um, uh, captured by the um, bond graph induction method by Stefanelli and co and one thing that we have in mind is so-called bicrystals, where now you have, again, atoms, but you have two types of atoms, type A and type B, and they still want to get close to each other. And they um, try to minimize this energy, which is now slightly more complicated. So um, atoms of same type, they again do the sticky thing as before. And atoms of different type, they also interact to, to each other. They also want to glue but maybe with a different value. And now you ask yourself, what are optimal configurations in this case? Okay, beta is the, the interaction between two different types. And if you want, you can also understand that as a as an discretization of a continuum problem. And the continuum problem would correspond to a situation where you have two types and you have the perimeter. So let me draw something. Maybe you have type A here and type B here. And this energy is just counting the length of the perimeter. Here, the outer perimeter is uh, has um, weight one, 
And here you have a different um, weight when you are at the perimeter between the two faces, namely you have two minus two beta. Okay. And the L1 perimeter just means that um, what's important is what the length uh, um, along projections in the horizontal and vertical lines. Okay, so that's the one perimeter, nothing else. Okay, and uh, what can you say about this problem? So what is known? It's known what happens in the continuum case. So in the continuum case, depending on the ratio of the two volumes, you can expect different things to happen. That maybe is the first thing that you expect. If you have two volumes which are graph of the same kind, you just glue them together. But more fancy things happen in if the volumes are very different. So what we did with um, Ulisse Stefanelli and uh, Void Pegoni, our um, postdoc in Vienna, is the discrete case in the case that the two atom number of atoms is the same, which corresponds to this type. So you have the same volumes. And in this case, you can prove that there is always a minimizer which looks like this, or rather to say a discrete version of this. So the atoms are um, arranged in such a way that they form um, a shape like this. But we only did that under the assumption that we are on set two, that we already know that we are a subset of the lattice. And one interesting thing would be now to prove crystallization also in this setting. And we think that now our new techniques, they are the right techniques in order to tackle this problem. Okay, so I think I'm already a little bit over time. So I would leave you with um, the summary like this and I'm thanks for your attention.